If you have your Bibles, make your way to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, as we continue our series in this book, uh, two weeks ago we started the chapter 3 with a fresh start into our new year and then had to take a little detour last Sunday. Um, but we pick it back up in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Let me go ahead and read those verses. Paul writes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining for what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you you, and now tell you even with tears. These are the legalists in in the first two verses of chapter 3. These people brought Paul to tears because they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like the glorious body, to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. What a great chapter that we should set to our hearts. This morning I want to give us a spiritual pep talk. Have you ever had a good coach? A good coach can make even the worst situations seem attainable, can't they? You're down 20, but there's still another half to go. Here's what we're going to do. Good coaches motivate their players. If you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, are going to be disciples and going to disciple others, we need to learn how to give a spiritual pep talk every once in a while, like Paul does. Paul would have made a great coach. Because he was a great spiritual coach. I want you to consider this morning what makes Paul a good spiritual coach. The kind of coach we would want to be to our friends, to our spouses, to our kids. To anyone God would have us be a part of their lives. I want you to consider what Paul did for the Philippian believers. And so let's get right into it. Number one, what makes Paul a good spiritual coach? Paul was humble. That's what makes him a good spiritual coach. Think for me, think for a second here, of all the reasons that Paul could boast about being, a, 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 boast about his Christian walk. I mean, he was handpicked by Jesus To be an apostle to the Gentiles on the road to Damascus. God used Paul to write most of the New Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was a soul winner. He was a preacher of the God's word. Anyone that looked at Paul's life would have concluded that Paul was at the pinnacle of the Christian life. He was the best. And yet Paul knew he had not arrived. 
Paul's response to his walk was a walk of humility. Look at verses 12 and 13 with me again. Just highlight these verses about the humbleness, the grace of Paul's humbleness as he addresses the Christian church in Philippi. Paul writes, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. Down to verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. This was a constant uh, theme without, when, when Paul would address the churches. He knew that if you did not come to God with your knees bent, that you would elevate yourself. He would say it in, in the church in, Cor- uh, in, in Corinth. In, in chapter 10, verse 12, he says this to that church. He says, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. In the, in the church in Galatia, he would say it also in chapter 6, verse 3. For if anyone thinks he's something, when he's nothing, he, deceive him, he deceives himself. See, what you have to understand, and what Paul understood is, the closer that he got to Jesus the better that he understood that he needed God's forgiveness daily. Did you hear what I just said? That, that's humility. That the closer you get to Jesus, the more sinful you know that you are. Paul was humble because God was working in his life. Being humble understands that God has to continually work in your life. You will never arrive on this side of eternity. Paul was not bigger than life. He was not someone to be afraid of because you can't attain where Paul's at. He was a friend. He was a brother in Christ. He was someone you could come alongside with because Paul hadn't arrived. And that's somebody I want to follow. Paul was a great spiritual coach because he could relate to the people he was ministering to. I love a person like that. I can talk to a person like that. I talk to those kind of people about my struggles. I want to be transparent. I do that from the pulpit. We need to learn that we have not arrived and we will never arrive on this side of eternity. If you are a person That people are afraid to go to. Because they think you've got it figured out. And they can't share with you anything of their struggles. Then take heed what Paul's saying here. And maybe you'll begin to look at people the way Paul looked at people. And that way, the way Jesus looked at people. We all need to grow in humility. Beware, by the way, beware of people who make you feel like you can't measure up to their standard of the Jesus walk. Paul mentions these people, I'm not going to rehash the sermon, but in verses of chapter 3, verses 2 through 7, Paul reminds this church, and that's the context of chapter 3. He says, be very weary of the dogs that are in the church. And the dogs that are in the church are the legalists. The legalists are ruining the joy of the walk with Christ because you can never meet their standard. And Paul is very clear. Don't follow those people. They will ruin your walk. They are not spiritual coaches. They think they've arrived. And they will fall. 
Paul had some of the most incredible experiences. And yet, after walking, by the way, Philippians chapter 3, this is, this is some 25 years after uh, he, uh, uh, Jesus met Paul on the road to Emmaus. So Paul's been a Christian now for 25 years. And yet, and yet, he was not satisfied. He knew he needed to grow. And so do we. That's humility. Look at the first part of verse 12. I highlighted the word obtained. Not that I've already obtained this. The word obtained, it's an interesting word. It means that he, meaning Paul, has not fully applied God's promises yet. That's interesting. What Paul is saying is, I have not fully applied everything I've learned from Jesus in 25 years. I still have room to grow. This is the kind of guy I want to follow. Not because I want to have excuses for a sin-filled life, but I want to say, man, if Paul is continuing to grow, so do I. Listen to what Paul says at the very end of his life. Years later, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says this. This is a trustworthy saying, he tells Timothy. Deserving a full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you want to grow, if you want to really grow, the first step is is to admit how far you still got to go. Be humble. By the way, Paul just followed Christ's example. We learned that in chapter 2. Just to remind you, Paul tells us, know who Jesus is. That's how you become humble. Because Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So, the first thing, if you want to be a spiritual coach to those that you love, you have to be humble. Isn't that what makes a good coach, by the way? Even secularly speaking, the greatest coaches I had were those that actually did it. They didn't speak from an ivory tower. They actually did it, and they made mistakes, and they learned from them. I love humble coaches. But that gets me to my second point. Not only was Paul humble, but Paul was an example. Paul was an example. He lived it out. He didn't just talk about his Christian life. He didn't just teach it. He lived it. There's one thing to tell people how humble you are. There's another thing to be an example of that humility. And to show it. These verses in chapter 12, 13, 14 through 17, they're all characterized, you'll see it, they're characterized by action verbs. So it tells you that Paul was doing this. And the church knew it in Philippi. They were, he was in jail for crying out loud for preaching the word. But look at these verses. In, in the second half of chapter uh, 3, verse 12, it says, I press on to make it my own. Uh, the word literally means I'm running swiftly to catch that thing. I'm working hard. The idea is a runner going after the finish line. Paul wasn't stuck in his salvation. What I mean by stuck in salvation, that means you know that you're saved. You know that it's by grace through Jesus Christ that he has forgiven you of your sins. And you are so thankful you're saved. But that's as far as you go. You're stuck in your salvation. You're so thankful for your fire insurance. 
What Paul is saying is, no, there has to be a living out of what Jesus has done for you. The daily surrender of what Christ has done for you. And surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit that wants to transform you and I. Paul was saved for a purpose. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to get at Jesus' feet and find out. I mean, we need to lay hold of the purpose of our life. What is the purpose of your life? Paul would say your purpose is to follow Jesus with all of your heart in whatever you do. And Paul lived out this example. Verse 13, he says, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. The one thing I do. Paul was specialized. He had one track mind. He had one thing he wanted to do. You know what the secret of Paul's success was? He had a one track mind. You know what he was focused on? Making Jesus famous. In whatever he was doing. He wanted to please the Lord. That's what made him a great example. That's what made him a great coach. He did it. Follow me as I follow Christ, Paul would say. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. Paul refused to look at his past. The word forgetting there, it means I'm no longer going to be affected by my past. In other words, Paul was never affected by what mistakes he made in the past. Because that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to quit. Because you screwed up. Because you sinned again. Because you looked at that. Because you said that. You're worthless. And yet Paul would be a spiritual coach and he'd say, get back You are a follower of Christ. And there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Paul says, I am not going to be held or affected by my past. As you are running for the Lord, stop looking at how other people are running their race. There will always be people that are able to outrun you. There will be always people who will lag behind you. There will be even people that you know that will drop out of the race. Don't worry about what other people are doing in their walk because it's your walk. It's my walk with Jesus Christ. I love what Hebrews says in chapter 12. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Does it look like the author of Hebrews is looking back? I love that Coach Paul is pointing forward. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, every single morning, God's mercy is renewed in you. Every single morning, you get a fresh start with the Lord. The question is, will you surrender today? Will you surrender to his work in your life and move forward? That's what Coach Paul would say. He says in verse 13, go back, verse 13, it says straining forward and reaching forth. The phrase here literally means like when you're in a race. Look at the picture up in the forward. The the literal translation in the Greek is, is like you're straining forward. You're coming to the finish line and you want to win. Can we honestly say this morning? That we're straining for the goal of walking with Christ? Does does our walk look like this? To be an example, a good coach, 
there had to be radical changes that take place. To, to look like this in your walk, there has to be a lot of surrender to the will of God in your life. By the way, Jesus would say this. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body gets thrown in hell. What is Paul saying here? What he's saying here with hyperbole is there has to be a radical change to your life. For you to be an example to others of what Christ has done in your life, there has to be a change. You've got to want to change. And the way you want to change is surrendering your life to Christ. It's not pulling up your bootstraps and doing 10 push-ups and saying, okay, I'm ready. No, it's waking up saying, God, I'm ready, you lead. That's what Paul's talking about. That takes radical change, doesn't it? Because I can promise you, every one of us wake up in the morning with a fleshly intent. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know that this battle is a war between your flesh and the spirit. The new spirit that's in you, the new Greg, is always at battle with the old Greg. But at least there's a battle. But because before I knew Christ, I could care less. I was just surrendering to the flesh. At the end of Paul's life, he said to Timothy, for I am now, listen to what he says, for I am now, 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 or 7, for I am ready, being poured out. There's this idea that he's he's just, he's been all in. I'm being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You can see that Paul can lean forward. By the way, Jesus showed us the perfect example, didn't he? At the end of the ministry on earth, Jesus said, knowing that all was finished, meaning he fulfilled all of scripture. He said, I thirst, and a jar full of sour wine stood there. And so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, to telestai, it is is finished. Jesus was the perfect example. And Paul followed Jesus. Last one. Yeah, we got a good time. Paul was humble, made him a good coach. Paul was an example, made him a good coach. And Paul was an exhorter. It made him a good coach. What's an exhorter? An exhorter in Scripture is someone who speaks to your heart. Not just your minds, so that you can be smarter, but dig, digs down on what's going on in your heart. This isn't just about education. Oh, I know these verses so that I can throw a verse at you and call me in the morning. It's for heart change. This isn't about education. This is about application. An exhorter makes a plea to the hearts of those who will be listening. An exhorter tells the truth. Whether you want to hear it or not. Because it's necessary to hear. That's a good coach. What does good coach Paul Exhorting the heart of the Philippian church. I'll tell you in one word as we close out these verses. One word, Paul's exhorting the Christian. Be disciplined. Be disciplined. They had to be disciplined in their walks. Look at verses 15 and 16. Let those 
of us who are mature think this way. What way? Humbly and doing what Christ tells us to do. That way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. So what Paul's telling the Philippian believer, what he's speaking to their heart is he's saying this. Take a chill pill, Christian. When it comes to thinking that you can control other people. It's your walk. You're not in charge of someone else's walk. I can't make you practice. I can't make you dribble with your left hand if you're white, whatever. I can't make you do it. What Paul's saying here is you got to want to do it. You got to want to surrender your life to Christ. He is speaking to the believer's heart that's been changed by the grace of God. He is speaking to the hearts, not to those who don't know Christ. Your flesh isn't going to change. He's talking to the one who has really been born again through faith in Christ. That's a heart that can be changed through surrender with Christ. Paul says, you're not going to be able to make somebody else do this. This is about you. If you want a mature way to think, you got to want to do it. Don't worry about what other people are thinking. If they think something else, God will reveal it to them. And if it's not of God, he'll reveal it to them. You worry about you. Isn't that a good coach? Our response to how Jesus is working in our life is our responsibility. Paul says in verse 16, he says, hold true. The idea of this verse is that Paul's saying, I've been changed by God's word. I was not changed by legalism. Because the context is chapters two through se- or chapter 3 all the way through this. So what Paul's saying is, these people that are coming into the church saying, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. If you're really going to follow Jesus, Paul says, that's not how I came to Jesus. And don't think that that's how I'm going to follow Jesus. I'll hold to what is true. In other words, I'll hold to what Jesus actually said. Not your rendition of Jesus plus things. What Paul is saying is, we got God's word, let's just follow that. See, what legalism does is it starts to add burdens to your walk. Legalism makes you feel like you're just not measuring up to the standard of Christianity. And so you know what you do and what some of you have done is you just quit. If you can't measure up, then I just quit. And this is why I 100% believe that legalism is of the devil. They love to sugarcoat Jesus in it, but it is the most destructive thing In the church. Because it makes people quit their walk with Christ. It makes them feel like they just can't measure up. God forbid we ever be a church like that. God forbid we ever be a Christian like that. Paul exhorts the church to follow his example. Look at verse 17. He says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Not the legalists. Follow my example. And like Epaphroditus, who's in the church. Follow their example. Look at them. Look at him. Verses 18 and 19, you start to see the the destruction of those legalists. For many of whom... Uh, I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. Paul was sick. Sick to his stomach what legalists have done to the church. They're enemies of the cross. Even though they bring up Jesus. 
Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Following legalists in this context, Philippians chapter 3, Paul's saying it will kill your walk. It's going to kill your walk. And an exhorter tells the truth. And that's what Paul was. Paul's telling the truth. An exhorter tells the truth. Paul told them the truth, but I love what Paul does. You know, and this is what a good coach does. He's going to tell you all the crap you're doing wrong. You know, don't do this. My, my, my son's playing on a, on a basketball team and his coach yells all the time. But it's good. And he, he's okay with it because he wants to learn. I said, Bo, that is what a coach wants. Listen, he, he, he wants you to know if he has to yell or whatever, that he just wants you to do it the right way. You'll enjoy the game more if you do it the right way. So an exhorter tells the truth, but then an exhorter doesn't just tell you what you're doing wrong. He always ends with an encouragement of what you're doing right or what you should be doing. He ends with a positive. But you did this good, and I'm really proud of you that you did this. Paul ends this whole uh, passage of Scripture with, a, with all positives. He, he tells you, listen, he says, as an exhorter, I need you to know we're not going to follow the dogs because we have something greater that's coming. And so he ends uh, with all these positives, all these perspectives that a Christian should have about what we all get, positively speaking, in the future. So he says, our citizenship's in heaven. In other words, we don't have to worry about what happens on this side of eternity. We do not rise and fall on what happens in this country. We don't. Because we're citizens of heaven. And we wait for his coming. I, I do pray. I pray he comes back. I don't want to physically die. I would prefer, well, I know I'm going to physically die, but I prefer that Jesus, the trumpet goes in the next five minutes, because I want to finish, in the next five minutes, and we just, all of us who are no Christ, are just ushered up into heaven. That I want. And Paul says, that's something we will experience, if that's God's will. So we can await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. Listen, I hurt my back so bad this week. Praise God for Lacey Detmering, Inside Out Chiropractic. I get, I get a fee. I, get, I think I get my next Monday off by saying that. I don't. But literally, I could not walk this week because I'm never shoveling the rest of my life again. I'm too old to shovel. I cannot shovel. I now know that I am old. I used to love shoveling. I would have perfect lines because I'm very particular. And it would just be perfect. Now I'm realizing that is all sinful and God is punishing me. <laughs> so now this is why God gave me two sons. I'm thankful he's going to transform this lowly body and give me a new one. And some of you who are in real pain, some of you who are walking through chronic pain. You can do so with a positive outlook that God will give you a heavenly body. Why is this perspective important? A good coach knows to end on a positive because we have to have a, a positive forward outlooking of life. And what Paul says is set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Have a heavenly perspective of life. You know, a good coach, by the way, commands the authority to listen, doesn't they? I mean, when they're a good, when they're a good coach, you just want to listen to every word that they say. I truly believe they were just hanging on every word that Paul said. Because he was a good coach. But Paul only followed his Savior, who is the greatest coach. Listen to what Jesus said, or listen to what Matthew said in 
chapter 7, verse 29. For Jesus taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. The greatest coach is Jesus Christ, and we follow him. So what's the application? We close. You want to be a good coach? You want to be a spiritual coach to those people that you love? Number one, you have to be humble. You have not arrived. Acknowledge to the person that you're still a sinner, that God's working in your life. Otherwise, they could care less about what you say. They need to know that you're struggling too. If you cannot acknowledge that, if you cannot share your experiences of repentance, how Jesus helped you, you will never be the kind of coach that God wants you to be. Be humble. Secondly, be a good example. Live out your faith. If you say you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but there is no showing of evidence that you're a follower of Christ, you are not a coach. Or or even more, you you think you're a coach, but no one really listens to you. They may say, oh yeah, He's talking again. But behind your back, they're sitting there saying, dude, he or she, they don't live out the word. I could care less what they say. Now, if you're one of those persons, and I've been that person too, where I'm not living it out. I can preach it, but God's working. And see, the, the, the thing is, I have to actually preach every week, and God's working on a lot of things. So I'm preaching about things that God has to work on. But I I can tell you this. If you do not live out your Christian walk, you are the saddest Christian on this side of eternity. Because Paul would tell you, he saved you for a purpose. Paul says, I have a purpose. What was his purpose? Point people to Jesus. Jesus didn't save you so that you could be stuck in your salvation. He saved you for a purpose to glorify him wherever he has you. And then finally, you want to be a good coach, you got to be able to tell the truth. And the great thing is, is that God gave us over 35,000 verses to be the barometer by which our truth comes. We don't have to worry about what the world tells us truth is. We know what the truth is. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. I know what the truth is. The question is, is will I follow it? Good coaches, brothers and sisters in Christ, as good coaches, we've got to be able to tell each other the truth in love and grace. And it's not your version of truth. Did you notice that in Philippians? It's the truth. You may have a particular way of way in which you like to do things. It doesn't mean everyone else has to do it your way. Did you know that? You're in danger of being a legalist if everyone has to do it your way. Why don't you stick to God's word and let him work on you? And then be a good coach about how God has transformed you. Me. You know, there's one last application, and this is this. All these things, if you're not a follower of Christ, if you've not trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can apply these things in your life. Principles, be humble, be a good example, tell the truth. All those things, you can apply those to your life. You could leave here and think, I got some great principles to be a better person. And you will die in your sins. Jesus didn't have you come to church to learn a bunch of principles. He learned, he wanted you to come here so that you could fall in love with Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. You are here to hear this message. You ready? 
You are a sinner. And you have fallen short of the glory of God. And because of your sin, you are separated from a holy God. And the only way that God is going to allow you to be in his presence when you die is that Jesus had to bridge the gap. And he did that on the cross. His substitutionary atonement. It means that Jesus took our place on the cross in exchange for my acknowledgement of my sin. He gives me his righteousness so that I can be in heaven. For Isaiah prophesies, he says that Jesus, the Messiah, will clothe us with a robe of righteousness. Either you're wearing God's clothes or you're trying to get into the banquet with your own clothes. And God has some harsh words in Luke in a parable of the banquet where he says the person came into the banquet wearing his own clothes and he cast him out. Put your faith and trust in Christ and let him do a work in your heart so that you can be saved. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenge of Paul's life as he followed you, Jesus. I thank you for the examples in this church. Many examples. Good spiritual coaches. Not because they've arrived, but because they're humble. Because they're living out the examples. Because they're holding to the truth of God's word. Lord, if there's any in this room that want to experience that kind of discipleship. That you would impress upon them to reach out to individuals in the church to join a Bible study. Not so that they can further their education, but that they might further their application of their Christian life. May they do the things that the church offers not for any other purpose than to surrender their lives to you. God, we thank you. We want it to be all about what you're doing, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said.